You're listening to the In Focus Interview Show, brought to you by Photofocus.com, an online publication filled with education and inspiration for visual storytellers. This episode is made possible by our partners Loom Cube, the world's most versatile light, and Drobo, a smart storage solution. Now, here's your host, Vanelli. Hello and welcome. I'm Vanelli. Now, my guest is a California based educator, motivational speaker, and peace builder working to change the cause of social conflict. Over the last 15 years, he has managed field programs in the Middle East and Latin America, led advocacy in initiatives in Washington, crewed on film productions, and taught peace studies for college students. He makes content to share things he's passionate about and to connect with others who want to use their talents to make the world better. Please welcome John Filson. Hello, John. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much. I'm glad to be here. Good. Well, John, our topic is using photography to invoke world change. So let, let, yeah, let's talk about, first of all, your, your background and filmmaking, because this will give us an insight and, and an example of how we as photographers and as filmmakers can apply our own talents. Absolutely. So uh, at, at my core, I'm a peace builder, which means the thing that fires me up is helping people overcome misperceptions or resentments between people who are not like them. Um, and I got into filmmaking as a method to be able to do that more effectively. Essentially, I started out doing field work in the Middle East and Latin America, like you said, uh, some in the United States. And I really got a good perspective, a grassroots perspective on why people hold negative views of others and leads to group and social behaviors that are harmful. And that led me to advocacy work in Washington, working at the policy level for many years. And I discovered something really interesting the longer I was there, which was prior to coming to Washington, I thought these are the people in the government. They're highly educated. They're very smart and capable. They must know about what's going on in the world. And they must just be deciding to have policies that they do. But what I realized was even the most powerful person in Washington, even the president, can only operate within certain parameters based on what is publicly acceptable to American voters. So essentially, I was working in foreign policy advocacy at the time. So our foreign policy is based more than anything on the collective perceptions that American voters have about the world. And over time, I combined that, those realizations with my interest in filmmaking and, and communicating in, in a visual way, because I realized that talking only on the intellectual plane about facts and logic is much less effective than storytelling or, or sharing information through images, as your audience knows. So that's how I got into uh, – so I left my cushy policy job and started crewing on shoots as a, as a PA – Got, wow. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yep. And um, worked mostly on just on commercial things, uh, some independent projects, but uh, worked a bit, was able to you know produce things, which I had some transferable skills, organizational skills from my previous jobs that that were were good for producing, but no big TV or film or anything like that. And I'm still very much a novice in all of those things, but I understand the process, um, having done it for a few years now. And um, that's so, – so my goal then is to make content and help others make content that communicates themes that are universal to the human experience, much like your audience does, in a way that can help people bridge social divides. Well, that's great. Well, John, what I took from what you just said was <laughs> here you have a passion for something and – you said you're self-proclaimed, you know, you're not a pro, you're not an expert at it, but you jumped in and you had no problem being a PA, you know, um, a production assistant, and you learned. And I'm sure you learned a ton of stuff while you were on set and that added to your background in filmmaking. So it's not 
for people who say, well, I have no talent whatsoever you know, in filmmaking. Well, how can I do this? Well, here's proof. You just said, hey, look, you know what? Find people that are doing it. Jump on board with them. Learn. And then, like you said, go on and start developing your own. So I thought that was a great, um, a great takeaway from your background. Absolutely. Absolutely. Great. Now, John, I love your concept about supporters. Not, you know, I, I love your, con- let me try that again. Now, John, I love your concept about being supporters, not rescuers. Now, what do you mean by that? This really comes first and foremost from my work overseas, working with communities in, in conflict zones. Um, I worked uh, 20 months in Iraq. I worked almost a year in Latin America prior to that, a um, little bit in Africa and, and also in inner city Los Angeles. And, and what I took away from that in terms of life, life lessons is simply that there is so much to understand that I don't know. And even though I'm looking at the world and I'm trying to judge it honestly based on uh, true information and I can only see tiny bits of the larger picture that's out there. And when I allow myself to see the world through other people's eyes, number one, it helps me connect with them, which is magical. But number two, it greatly expands my perspective on the world and makes me much wiser, more effective in my work. Um, and just, I, I feel like it invites me to be a better person. And so that I came to international development work with that through, through that lens and the concept really, which is not anything official. It's just my shorthand way of, of saying, you know, don't, don't be a rescuer, be a supporter is just the, the simple idea that the people in a certain, I'm assuming that we're talking about photographers that are working in, in some place that's not their home or their home community. Yeah, or um, even and, photographers and, that love to take these trips. Like I, I'm here in Florida and mm-hmm. Cuba was a huge spot for right. local photographers to want to go. And, and I like what you're saying, instead of supporting, they look at that, that as, well, I'm going to rescue these people. And I love right, right. how you're saying, hey, hey, back up for a moment. Be a supporter, not a rescuer. Right. And it's a it's a funny balance because um, we are so I'm I'm white. I'm 40. I'm from California. I've never had I've never been hungry. I do have power that a lot of people in places I might go don't have. I, my, my passport, I can travel almost anywhere I want to. You know, I have the means to do that. They don't. So I do have power. Um, it's, it's a, it's about understanding what to do with that in relation to interacting with others. And so it's a mindset shift that's from, that gets myself out of the mindset of I'm smart and capable and the people who I may be interacting with on the street in a place, you know, in a, in a less rich country appear less educated or, uh, you know, a poorer or, or whatever. And so automatically I'm thinking that they need my help, not the other way around. And what I would like to do is put forward the idea that actually they have so much that I need just personally, but especially professionally, if I'm trying to do good work and create a good product in their home. Oh, I love that. You know, it's funny you're saying about the, people seeing it from a different perspective. Well, as you know, being here in Florida, we had you know, those major hur- hurricanes coming through. And where we are in Melbourne, the Indians came here because it was the Harbor City. It was a safe area. In fact, NASA built Kennedy Space Center here because, thank God, typically we don't get hit with the hurricane straight on. You know, we've had some bad ones, but nothing like Homestead or some of the other ones. Well, I saw on Facebook, somebody actually wrote, you people in Florida are stupid. Why wouldn't you just leave? Just get out of there if a hurricane is coming. And I'm sitting sitting here thinking, okay, I know I could do it financially. I could hop in a car, go somewhere, stay in a hotel. But I know a lot of people who can't do that financially. They don't have anywhere else to go. They have to stay here. So I like your perspective on saying, 
you know, learn to look through other people's eyes instead of throwing your, you know, um, preconceived notions on them. Absolutely. So, now, let me, yep, let me ask you a question. So let's say I go to um, Cozumel or the Bahamas and I had one friend whose philosophy was, you know, don't make them a beggar society. Don't give them money just for the sake of giving them money. Maybe instead give them supplies, maybe water, maybe a hat, maybe a jacket or something like, like wear a jacket with you. You see a kid doing some cool things and you know, you're going to give the jacket away, take the jacket off, give it to the child, you know, or the adult or so on. What's your concept? What's your philosophy on that? Well, I'd be interested in knowing what people are motivated by when they are thinking of doing that. Is it trying to be a kind person in the in the moment when you're interacting, or um, what is it you're trying to accomplish, or is it just how to be able to respond when maybe people approach you on the street, you know, maybe young kids or you know, asking for money or, or anything like that. It, it is awkward and uncomfortable and you don't necessarily what to do. It's that way in the United States too. Um, I would say money is better than nothing. Supplies are maybe a little bit better than money, but what's much more, much better than either of those is thinking ahead a little bit and doing a little planning about how can your skills and talents benefit the people where you're working in in more substantial ways so um if if we're talking about photography when you're scheduling a shoot i mean i guess i think it it starts with who your local contacts are and fixers if you're well connected to people that are uh, respected in the in their own community and understand it can be a very good quality guide for you not just about logistics about getting around and getting your shoot done but about what's going on in the context um what what do people need there's a lot of things that you can plan ahead of time that can be um empowering to people beyond just a quick interaction on the street for example you could offer you could organize a photography class uh, people aren't going to have the same equipment as you, but you can talk about basic principles of lighting or composition or the artistic nature of it. Or if you, like I said, if you are connected to local people or organizations, maybe they know of projects or service work that local people are doing that's inclusive of people and not creating more divisions that could benefit from you yourself doing some photography work for them for, for free or for a severely discounted rate. Um, how can you, how can your work support what they're doing uh, long after you leave? These are just, you know, a couple of ideas. Oh, I love that. And, and I like your whole concept on, you know, how is this going to affect them after you leave? You know, right, most, most right. people, yeah, they, they do it for a split moment and then they move on. Right, exactly. And, and again, from an international development perspective, you know, if you were to study international development, which is basically how do you help tackle global poverty and, and the systemic causes of chronic poverty, uh, a, a best practice or principle is local ownership um, and, and really not swooping in or we say they say parachuting in with all the answers and resources and then as soon as you as soon as your funders interests cha change or you are unable to go to a place not only can uh people not do the project but y you've sort of gotten everybody going and expecting something um which is which involves having difficult conversations and getting people uh organized i guess what i'm trying to say is there's a cost to people receiving you and working with you and if you uh don't show up or suddenly stop it creates you know negative disruptions and so in international development you say you know the best projects are ideas that people are already working on um even even without you things that are already successful and like i said inclusive of different 
groups of people based on their identity. It's not excluding somebody because of their religion or their ethnicity or something like that. And uh, obviously organizations that are capable and, and responsible and doing good work. And then your job is to listen to what they need and see if there's anything in your skills or resources or just your time that you can do to be supportive of what they're doing and help them do what they're already doing even better according to what they express would make that possible. And so the way that applies to uh, visual storytelling and a work in media production in my mind is because a lot of times we're so focused on getting the product and we need uh, the right subjects in the right place at the right time. We need them to sign a release, but otherwise my mind is necessarily understandably focused on, on getting the product done um, on, on time. But from an, when I, sort of moved into filmmaking from international development, I was asking myself, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of overlap here. How can the subjects not just be passive objects in your project, but how can what you're doing empower them to tell their own stories? And how can the way you operate on the ground during the shoot be empowering to them as well? So it's just, I think it's a matter of asking a different set of questions and maybe having uh, more advanced conversations with local partners rather than just quickly uh, zooming in, trying to get the best shot and zooming out. Now, I'm, I, I, would, I would just add to that that I think that's the right thing to do as people, and I think your listeners know that. But in case anybody needs any additional incentive, I think it's also much more beneficial to the quality of your product. People know what the interesting things are that are happening. They can tell you where the best uh, people or stories or um, things are that, or the best opportunities are to capture some really great stuff. And if you are just focused on the technical aspects or the logistics or, or getting, um, you know, in and out on schedule, you might miss those things. Well, that's awesome. Now I'm not, I'm not sure if you heard of, um, Watts of love, my, my buddy, Kevin, my buddy, Kevin Custer, what, what, what they do is the photographers, they go to developing countries and they actually give lights like a portable light that they can use. And what struck me with what you just said is how can we go to a country and, and like you said, not disrupt it, but help out? Well, what he decided to do was when he was there, not only give out these lights, <laughs> but he did an entire portrait session for weddings. And, Local weddings. You know, and for us, you know, when you think about, okay, so one wedding, no, we're talking hundreds of wow. people. Because he said they can't afford weddings on their own. So we're he said he's talking hundreds of people get together and they throw multiple weddings, <laughs> you know, to, to split the cost. And he was photographed. He said, wow, he, he didn't realize what he was getting into. But a lot of these people have never had their photo taken before. Right. And which I didn't realize some of them don't have mirrors. They have yeah. no idea what they're looking, what they look like. Um, yeah. And so, of course, the joke between him and I were, you know, if, if, if I were there, I would look in the mirror and go, wait a second, I got to marry her and I look like this? <laughs> <laughs> you got the short end of the stick. Oh, my. <laughs> so, well, that's great. Well, John, you know, let's talk about strategies to deal with conflicts, you know, if we're presented with them. But we're going to talk about that after we take a quick break to thank our partners. Loom Cube. Loom Cube is proudly known as the world's most versatile light. It's the smallest, lightest, most compact professional lighting solution on the market. Loom Cube represents the future of LED lighting and is a must have for anyone looking to create better photos and video. Check out the new Loom Cube strobe, offering anti collision lighting for drones at loomcube.com. Drobo. Drobo is a smart storage solution that protects photos, videos, and more from hard drive failure, giving peace of mind for the working pro or serious amateur who have a lot of external drives cluttering up their desktop. 
Save 10% at drobostore.com with the coupon code PHOTOFOCUS. And we're back with a highly motivated uh, peace builder, John Filson, uh, talking about using photography to involve world change. So, John, what are some of the strategies you teach to deal with conflicts you know, if you're presented with them? Well, we can talk. Um, I mean, do, do you mean in a moment when you're you're shooting in a context and you you accidentally do something offensive and, and conflict uh, arises? Is that what you mean? Or do you mean more broadly? Or no, mean no more that's broadly? good. I like, I like that. You know, be, uh, here's a good example. So my, mm-hmm. ba- my buddy Abe Curlin from B&H Photo is very strong in his Jewish faith. Well, I had no idea that part of his religion is, no, they don't make contact with females. And men don't make contact with the females. You know. So his wife, for example, they came for a visit. They brought all the food. They brought all their plates because everything had to be kosher. Well, I hugged her. And it wasn't until about six months later, I realized, well, wait a second. Abe, I wasn't supposed to do that, was I? And he starts laughing. And he said, V, before we walked into the house, I turned to my wife and said, Vanelli's a hugger. (laughs) 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 And she said, not a problem. Vanelli, trust me, she wasn't complaining. (laughs) And so he you know, because then, then of course, he brought out, you know, his philosophy on that and said, look, there was no intention. So it's not, so in his eyes, no, it wasn't a sin because there wasn't an intention. So from his perspective, now whether or not I agree or disagree out of respect, I told him, okay, from now on, you know, when I see your wife, you know, I'll just bow instead of, you know, giving her a hug. And he goes, no, V, you're fine. (laughs) You know, but like you just said, the respect. So in that case, that's one way I approached it. You know, so with you, within your travels, I'm sure you've seen people make stupid mistakes. Um, right, so right. what are what are some strategies that they could fix that? Oh uh, well, I I've made plenty of stupid mistakes, um, and and you know, but your story is perfect because their reaction is really similar to reactions that I've experienced. People know you're from another place with other traditions. Um, in my experience, it's not about mistakes you make. It's not even about who you are or why you're there. Although those things matter, what what it ultimately boils down to in my experience is can people tell immediately that you have love and respect in your heart and they have a, a bullshit meter like any, like any of us and you can't fake it. If you're uh, if, if in your mind, it's some kind of um, voyeuristic uh, tourism, you know, into an exotic place, you're not going to get the same kind of reception and definitely not the same kind of access as if you are seeing the individuals that you encounter as, I mean, uh, equal doesn't begin to describe it um, as teachers, as guides, as people that can help you learn and do your work better. If you're not seeing them that way, um, you're, you're already on the wrong foot. So in my experience, if, if conflict does come up, you don't have to worry that, oh no, you know, I've done something irreversible and now, you know, how am I going to get out of this? Uh, Just as an aside, if we're talking about active conflict zones, that's a different set of questions um, where there's, you know, active armed conflict, those sort of uh, principles start to break down in situations like that. But generally speaking, um, if you respond in a way that shows respect, not just in your words, but in your actions that, that translate across language barriers, just in your body language and your facial expressions. And if you're respectful and deferential, um, chances are you're not going to have really any, any troubles. And, and nine times out of 10, responding in that way turns the person you offended into a friend and they want to help you because they realize that, A, you listened you understood, you, you were willing to change, and now they like you. Oh, I like that. I like that. Now, you've been in, I take it, um, major conflict zones where there, are, there were armed people? 
Yes, I've been uh, probably the closest would be Iraq. I, I lived there um, just in you know, well, technically in a in a Chaldean Catholic seminary, an Iraq an Eastern Iraqi church um, from the Assyrian people, um, uh, you know, outside any armed compound during um, 2007 to 2009. I was in northern Iraq. And so, so this was the Kurdish provinces. And there, so there were roadblocks and armed soldiers and the, the visual cues of war everywhere. But I was never, uh, I never needed to take cover from bullets or um, explosions or anything like that. Gotcha. But like you just said, it was evident that that was it. In fact, um, after 9-11, we went to visit uh, East Hampton, New York. And for the first time, you know, we took a, a train into East Hampton. We, we flew into New York City, hopped on a train, took the train into East Hampton. For the first time ever, I saw armed National Guards at the stations. Mm-hmm. And and here I had, my son was about, um, let's see, about five, six years old, uh, six or seven years old. And for the first time, I was like, Wow. You know, I've never seen an armed soldier mm-hmm. at one of our in one of our you know train stations or airports, mm-hmm. and yeah, it was it was a little freaky. It, so in that case, yeah, that's not the time to start joking, right? That's not the you know, be polite, be respectful. Um, you know that yeah, like I said, that's not the time to crack jokes or hey, can I touch that gun? That looks pretty cool. All right. Well, it was funny too. That is an eerie feeling when it's your home, your country, and and you we're privileged to to not have that experience ever. Uh, fortunately, and hopefully we won't. But when I was the one time that I um, overlapped with American soldiers in during and this was you know after the surge and um, but still well the war was was. Uh, still ongoing it was because i was with a community outside of mosul talking with some people that had had been um, chased out of their homes by some of the extremist groups and uh here comes these uh, you know i should i should learn the correct uh name for the vehicle uh what type of military vehicle it is but it's tall and it looks wobbly has a lot of antennas um and you know out come these I know that they're, uh, you know, some of America's finest men and women, um, well trained, you know, with their game face on, and they're doing their job. But to people who don't have my context, you know, Iraqis, these I'm not kidding you. These are cyborgs from another planet who are decked out to the nine, and they're, you know, I met a woman from. Uh, she was originally her family. She immigrated from Haiti, but she grew up in Boston. I met a guy from Texas, um, and these, and they were just no joking at all. It was, it was. We have a job to do. We don't know if this is a safe situation, and they were ready for anything to happen. And they couldn't believe that I just lived there. Um, they had to ask me several times, like, what do you mean you live here? That doesn't, you know, um, but anyway, it's a, it's conflict zones, um, create a whole different set of challenges and questions. And if, if there, if a lot of your listeners, um, are, are, uh, correspondents in, in conflict or photographers in, in those contexts, you know, maybe that's worth a, a conversation too. Okay, John, now let me ask a question. Going back to our local, because I've always felt charity begins at home, you know, and then of course we branch out. So for those people that don't have the means of traveling overseas or making change elsewhere, what are some changes they could do? What are some projects you would like to see people focusing more on locally, whether it's the homeless, um, it could be abused children, what are some projects you feel they could use their talents on locally that'll help invoke world change? It's so funny that you asked that because this is a question that has just kind of naturally been in my mind my whole life. And I don't know why. Um, it's so hard when we have uh, the needs of our family and uh, things that we have to get done and just managing our own life. 
how can we be more supportive or, or help others in that way? It's just a really challenging thing and there's no simple answers, but I, I would love for people to ask themselves, who is a type of person that I really don't know anything about, but I, but I encounter in my day? Is it you know, people who live on the street and I, and I feel awkward and I don't know what to say or do, or is it, um, Im- immigrants that, uh, you know, cut my lawn, um, but I don't really interact with them. Is it, you know, p- police officers and I don't, and I, I just have always kept my distance because it's intimidating or, you know, whatever it is, who's a, who's a, a type of person that you don't naturally know. And then ask yourself, you know, what is your perception of that person and, and what, um, how they see the world? And just be curious to know, about, I mean, I could tell you and, and you know just intuitively that whatever, you, whatever your image is, there's much more to the story than that. Especially photographers that are telling visual stories. As, you know, as storytellers, you know there's much more to the story. So what can you do to learn more about? that person to reach out um simple things like have a have a box of supplies in the back seat of your car uh canned food or uh you know clean towels or anything that you can offer to the person at the off ramp other than um you know just a smile or or nothing or um, you know, stop and talk to people or uh, chat them up, ask them, um, try to learn about their experience. There are so many opportunities to be supportive. It's just, it all starts with understanding people's world and what they need. And if you are interested in asking yourself those questions and, and trying to answer them, you will have no shortage of opportunities to be supportive to people based on what you have to offer from your experience and talents and resources. You know, and it could even be, um, and it's not just people like uh, Kaylee Greer is a pet photographer and she had a new TV series out um, on A&E called a paparazzi and uh-huh. she, she shoot fly into town. And the first thing she, so she's on an assignment to photograph for a company but while she's in town, she visits a kill shelter and then she mm-hmm. photographs these animals to try to get them adopted. And then she goes off and does her commercial shoot. And so you watch how she does it from, from the photography standpoint. And then the, the next scene is her back at the kill shelter doing the shoot you know, actually showing you what they've done and how the, the, uh, the animals were placed you know, after they did the, you know, the, the special shoots to get the recognition out now. And I thought about that. She's so passionate when it comes to animals. My father was so passionate for the homeless. Uh, he was a, he passed away at the age of 92. Uh, he was a deacon in the Catholic church and from 1970 up literally up until a week before he passed away, he was working with the homeless and that was always his, passion. And for our family, of course, he got us involved and we would, you know, feed the homeless or (laughs) this was neat. He would actually have parishioners, each, you know, family would actually once a week, let's say supply uh, food to feed. I forgot how many people there were in the shelter, but he would actually get donations and they would actually, he would just pay, he would drop off the lunch meat, the sandwiches, and they would have to pack it. Well, at the time, I was a former martial arts champion. So at the time I was on the karate circuit, he would say to me, well, hey, do you think you and your buddies can come over to the house and make sandwiches for the homeless and we could pass them out? They'll love seeing these your karate champions passing out food. And so we all got there. And my father, of course, being who he was, would say, just so you know, I usually have elderly women that do this. They do this whole procedure in less than 30 minutes. <laughs> I was like, really? So Try to you keep should up. have seen a bunch of martial arts champions that were very competitive laying out the bread on the table. And we ran. You should, we, we had sweat coming off of us. We got done. And he goes, wow, you guys are already done? I said, what are you talking about? He goes, 
I was just kidding. <laughs> he was, they used to take a day or so, but I knew you guys could never pass up a challenge. Oh, wow. But oh, to this goodness. day, now that was, you're looking at close to 25, 30, longer. Oh, my God. I'm, I'm getting up there in age. Over 30 years ago, if not longer, and it's so neat that my friends still remember that. And my father invoked change with them, how they how they felt feeding the homeless, just that, that feeling they gave that to them. So for myself, yes, I try to take on some of his passion, and I have a, a new series coming out, hopefully in the next year, year and a half, about the homeless. I've had my moments is the title. And I'm hoping that that's going to help bring people to the table to help feed the homeless locally. So I, I see what you're saying about, you know, find a passion. And then once you have that passion, you know, get other people involved, get them excited into that passion. So. It, oh, I was just going to say, and it, it might sound hard to understand because we're, we're, we're talking in theory. We're just talking conceptually about this. And so someone who's listening might, might think, you know, mm, okay, but I don't really understand, you know, what I should do if I want to be, you know, help the homeless, for example, or be help or, or, or bridge social divides. I don't understand what I should do. And my, my response is you don't necessarily need a packaged suggestion from somebody with a bow on it. I think it, it starts with the decision to ask yourself the question, how can I be helpful to people based on where I am, what I have, what I love to do, especially with what you love to do? Um, and just an asking that question turns your brain onto a different channel and answers start coming because you know the people that are in your every day and the people that you interact with. Um, it could be as simple as just – uh, scheduling 10 extra minutes on a commute so that you don't have to rush. And if somebody, and if you come across somebody, you can actually stop and talk just really simple things. Um, so, and I, I would, the, the, the th thing I would say is that once you start doing that, this all of this becomes not conceptual. It becomes very real and and authentic and tangible in your own life, and your and you it blows your mind, and you start just seeing so much that you didn't see before, and expands your opportunities and your perspective, and it changes you ultimately to be a better um, person and human that can. Uh, be of service to others. And so if, if it's hard to know what to do or where to start, what I'm saying is start and, and you'll, you'll see exactly what happens. Question. Um, and I'll give you my, one of my examples and you'll tell me, you know, where we're heading with this. Um, you got everyone motivated right now to help the world change. So what are some tips we can use to get our message out to involve or to help others invoke this world change. Um, and I'll give you one example. It doesn't have to be huge. It doesn't have to be like the stuff that you've done overseas or what my father has done. It could be a simple little uh, photo you take on Facebook. In fact, the example I'd like to share is I, I am blessed that I have a lot of great interns with incredible hearts. And one, one of my, current interns. His name is Jason. He's also a fireman. Well, we got done having a breakfast meeting. And when we have breakfast, what we like to do is we film like coffee and photography with Vanelli and friends. So we like to do a little filming while we're doing this. So while we're eating, we talk about photography and different things. We were done. We're heading out to our car. And there's this cute little old lady walking in her walker. And she's about to put it in her trunk and you could tell she's having difficulty. So without hesitation, my friend Arnold says, do you need help? And she goes, Oh, gentlemen, thank you. Here comes the fireman, Jason. He opens the trunk, puts the, the walker in, and then he takes her by the hand and walks her to the front of the car. 
And she goes, oh, thank you. This would, this, she says, I could do it, but it, I have to use the car. And this makes it so much easier. Plus, you're a good looking guy. And we're laughing. <laughs> so I snapped a picture and I put it on Facebook. And all I wrote was, I love my friends. Here is a Melbourne, Florida fireman, firefighter, from his heart, helping the community. So it, it, in that one little picture, A, it showed, hey, look, our firemen, it, we're part of this community. Look is what look at one of our firemen are, is doing off the record or off the hours. He's not working right now. Here he is helping someone out of the goodness of his heart. And I just snapped that one little shot just to share it with the world. Um, you know, yeah, because I was proud of him. I was very proud that without even thinking, he jumped to it. So that was one way I could give an example on how to invoke world change is little things like that. You know, post it. Post a feel good, something on Facebook. For the love of God, please stay away from the political stuff on Facebook. Let, let's swap all of that stuff out and, you know, with or like teenagers. And I hate when people say, what's wrong with this world? What's wrong with this world? Nothing. Look how great these teenagers interact with each other. So right. what are some tips that you can use to get your message out? I think your your audience has one of the best tools already in their, I mean, you know, knowledge of and, and ability in photography um, to do exactly what you just said. It is an unlimited font of opportunities um, to do exactly that. What you just described, capture stories and share them um, that communicate the essence of what you think life is really about and how we can be better and follow that up with relationship building. If people express interest in, in that work and what you're doing, talk to them more. What, what are they seeing in their life? Um, what opportunities are there to, you know, if they're, if they're local, uh, can, can they benefit from, um, you know, meeting with you and maybe showing you around in their context and, and seeing if your skills can be helpful to what they're doing in some way. Um, I, I, I feel like I, your, your listeners know much better than I would um, the ways that their talent has helped people in the past. And, and I think it's just a matter of asking themselves the question of, you know, I would like to do the, the hard thing of scheduling time in my week, um, carving out mental space in my, in, in my worried mind um, to think about how I can use this to help others. And, and once they do, like you said, it's just um, the way life works is that one small action leads to something else, leads to something else, and especially being able to share it all on social media. Um, I just think the possibilities are endless. Oh, that's great. Now, John, this has been extremely informative and very motivational. Um, now, where can people learn more about you? I have a, a Facebook page at Filson Peace. F like Frank, I L S O N P E A C E at Filson Peace. Um, that's what I have now. Currently, I, I have a YouTube channel. Also, it's it's under my name, John Filson. It's uh, for now. It's it's a lot of the same uh, stuff. I have uh, content there about basic concepts in peace studies um, for people that want to learn more about what peace building is and and some of its basic concepts. I've actually. Uh, more recently struck up conversations, you know, speaking about how can you use what you have and what you're talented in to, uh, you know, benefit others. I being stuck in Iraq without other expats around was really wonderful and uh, nightmarish at times just with how difficult and lonely it was. But one positive result was I learned Iraqi Arabic really well, and Iraqis are um, continually impressed with my pronunciation. So I've made a lot of videos recently talking with them um, about issues of you know cultural differences and perceptions and misperceptions between our our cultures, and um, so there's a lot of uh, 
of that content on there too. And I always put subtitles so anybody can access them. But um, so that's a place to, to learn more about me and my background. Of course, I'm on LinkedIn also at, at John Filson. Hopefully you can find more of my, of my work um, and information about me in the future. That is great. And John, I can't thank you enough for taking time out of your schedule today and sharing your talents with us. Well, I appreciate the invitation and I love what you're doing. Um, and, and I hope this topic is helpful to people. And um, I just really appreciate you and the work that you're doing in this space um, for, for all of your listeners. And, and for me, I feel like everybody I meet who's doing good work, I learn so much from. So thank you for that. You are listening to the In Focus Interview Show. If you like these interviews, be sure to subscribe to our weekly Photo Focus podcast on photofocus.com. Thank you for joining us.